we're live. We are, yay. <laughs> okay. Um, do I have it pulled up? No. <laughs> we're going to borrow yours. All right, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> And now I have to find my way back. Okay, we're good. This is we're solid. We're golden. Okay. Um, so hello and welcome everyone to today's event. This is Women's History Month's um, book chat with two difficult women. Um, so that's not where you intended to be. You're here with us now, though. So yay! We got coffee um, and cookies. We have so coffee and cookies. Want. Yes. So, uh, just as an FYI, although I've shared it with just about everybody here. Um, this is going live, so we do have it streaming through YouTube. So hello, anybody who's joining us through YouTube or seeing this later on. Um, so we are doing this uh, live to kind of approach that hybrid thing. Um, as I told people who are here physically, and I will share with anybody who's watching online, um, we do intend this to be more of a discussion than anything else. It really is. We're going to lean into the whole chat feature. Um, so we could be talking, feel free to interrupt us because otherwise we're just going to keep going and going and going. Um, so feel free to chime in. We want to hear your thoughts on the topics that we're going to bring up and discuss as well. Um, it's not a, a Alexa Trisha show. It's really a conversation about it's centered on these two titles that we um, are going to highlight in reference to, but really this is a broader conversation about difficult women and things like that. Um, so we will have somebody monitoring the chat for live people. So feel free to type something in there or communicate and we'll be for sure to share that with everybody. Um, so thank you. Shout out to Emma Drumright, who's amazing, is going to help us with that. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to jump in. So I kind of referenced my name before. I am Patricia Hernandez. I go by Trisha. Um, and today I'm going to be the, the book that I chose to discuss today is Hood Feminism. It is by it's Hood Feminism Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot it is by Mickey Kendall. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So and my name is Alexa Height. I use she, her pronouns, and I chose Roxanne Gay's collection of short stories, Difficult Women. So, Trisha, why yes. did you choose Hood Feminism? Okay, so I have a story behind this. Uh, first of all, it's an amazing book. So if you haven't had a chance to read it, um, I do highly recommend it. Um, so my little mini story behind this, so bear with me and stick with me on this. Uh, we, as people, are consumers of information, right? We, information and forms us and, and it challenges us and it helps us make decisions and it guides us, correct? Um, so I that's true for me as well. And so I have a little mini background story of the first time I read a book called Inherit the Wind. Well, it's a play. So Inherit the Wind. Um, it is by, because I'm trying to get better about saying who things are by, it's by Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee. Um, that is not the general. Um, we have no idea if he's related to the general because we had a chat about this, <laughs> but um, it is by those two playwrights. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about what that, that particular story was about because that's not what we're talking about. But as a quick overview, it was a conversation and it was based on a true trial that happened. It is a very religious centric community and a um, teacher in a grade school wanted to introduce uh, Darwinism and evolution. So it was a huge issue. So me coming from a religious background had this, I read it in middle school. So had this mini little existential crisis on, wait a second, what happens when religion and science do conflict with each other? Um, and so I had to kind of work through that to this day. Obviously I am referencing to that experience. Um, it had an impact on my life. It had an impact on, on my belief system. It had an impact on where my the way I, I phrase things and the way that I have approached other things in this in this world. Um, so books do that to me. I read things, I absorb information, and they do have that kind of direct effect on who I am as a person. Hood feminism did that to me. Um, so I read Hood Feminism and I found myself um, learning about things and uh, perspectives that I I never paused to give consideration to. Um, not because I didn't want to consider, it's just something that just never came across my point of view. Um, so I had moments of that. Um, I also had moments where it challenged me. So it challenged me to reassess my, my perception of things. 
And then I had moments where I was just like, yes, I'm not alone in this. Like somebody else has experienced this. This isn't me being that crazy lady who, who had a weird experience or weird thought process. Um, the other thing is when I was reading this book, and um, anybody who saw me pre going live and starting this saw me doing this a lot. Like I got whiplash on my neck because as I was reading this book, I just kept nodding along like, yes, yes, no snaps there. I get you what you're saying. Um, that's that's what this book did. And any book that has had that impact on my life, like anybody who was around me when I was reading this. I think I reference, oh, yeah, and Hood Feminism, blah, 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 blah. And, oh, have you read Kendall's Hood Feminism? Like, they probably got tired of me referencing. It's like, do you read other books, Trisha? Because that's all I'm hearing from you. <laughs> um, so that's why I decided to choose that book. Um, it, it just had it's had such an impact on, on the way I see things. And it will continue to do so, um, I believe. So, so that's why I chose Hood Feminism. Why did you choose Difficult Women by Roxane Gay? Um, I will get to that. But I think... We have to give props to Emma because I believe she is the reason that we both read Hood Feminism yes, by yes. Nikki Kendall for our book club. So thank you, Emma, for choosing that <laughs> book. Um, we do try to read books in our popular reading collection, and both of the books that we're discussing today um, can be found when Trisha and I don't have them checked out in our popular reading collection. Um, to your point about books kind of helping re reframe your thinking. Um, Hood Feminism definitely did that for me in terms of soda taxes. Um, I had always been like for, for soda tax, like why not? Um, if something is going to help decentivize unhealthy choices, um, why not put a tax on them, right? But what Kendall points out is that something that I never experienced growing up, which is food deserts and having to, you know, rely on like the local gas station for your food. And the idea that yes, parents want to feed their children, um, you know, healthy, nutritious choices like milk, but maybe you don't have a refrigerator or you don't have, um, you know, a solid reliance on, on uh, power and, mm -hmm. and having that. So clean water. So yeah, when I, when I watched Parks and Rec, I was all, I was on Leslie Nope's side. I was like, yes, soda is disgusting. Thing and we should tax it. And like, it's not that I've never had soda. I have, but, um, you know, anything to, 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 um, make healthier choices. But I, that was something that Kendall opened my eyes to and, you know, walk, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. That was something that, um, really opened my eyes. I chose Roxanne Gay's difficult women because when we were talking about doing this event, um, I, I've, I kind of like how Trisha was talking about how you read Hood Feminism. Um, I am the same way with Roxane Gay as an author. And then for this particular work of hers, these short stories, um, I thought, you know, hey, we're having Women's History Month. Let's talk about um, an author that I really like, who is Roxane Gay. And then her story is Difficult Women. I often don't really remember what happens in books. <laughs> so um, I'm also terrible with names. So if you ask me about like, the characters, I, like two weeks later, I will have forgotten. Um, but I remember how books make me feel. So like Trisha's like snaps to that with with her book. And I was um, I was angry reading Roxane Gay's book because of the, you know, treatment of women in, in literature, in our society. Um, but I've also like cried on the bus on the way to work reading Roxane Gay's work because, you know, she writes from a place of her own experience and um, you can really feel the sexual, the sexual assault trauma that she, that she writes about um, in her work. And so I, I thought that this was a great book. The title itself, Difficult Women, I thought was interesting. Um, it is a term that is fairly common in our society. I'm wearing my obstinate <laughs> headstrong girl uh, t-shirt today. Um, you know, if you Google the term difficult women, this title comes up along with an essay published in Vogue about, um, you know, the well-worn expression, well-behaved women rarely make history. Um, you also find um, other books by with the difficult women in the title, a TV show with the same title, and even an article from a bridal magazine um, on how to deal with difficult women. And I did not click on that because I didn't want to go down that rabbit <laughs> hole. Um, but we have a question for y'all, which is, I'm going to ask Trisha, and then we can open it up to the audience. When you hear the term or phrase difficult woman or difficult women, what comes to mind? Yeah. Okay. And I stopped looking at you and I started looking at you on my screen. Okay. <laughs> I just realized, like, I'm like, yes, Alexa. That's yes. how we've been talking for like two <laughs> right? years. Yeah. I went automatic Zoom mode here. Um, yeah. So difficult women, that term, 
Uh, when I think of that, I think of, because I've had this conversation before, I think of the spicy Latina or the angry black woman um, and those kind of references a lot. Um, and, and when we were talking about this um, earlier, I referenced to the fact that I'm, I'm kind of passive. I don't like fighting with people. I don't like getting into arguments. And um, sorry, I just got dizzy. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm very passive with things. And because of that, when I do argue with somebody, it's like, oh, what's your problem? Are you okay? Is your period happening? What's going on? Yeah, always happens that way. So um, that's what I think of when I think of difficult women. I think it's that that perception that if if a woman challenges something, it's, it's she's being difficult. A man could do something similar. They could challenge or argue against something Um and it's, it's like, oh, they're being assertive or, oh, they they have great ideas. But the moment a woman does it historically, I'd love, I don't like to work in ultimate, like ultimates, I, you know, things, sometimes there are people who are learning and growing, um, but historically when a woman has challenged something, it's, she's being difficult. So going down that rabbit hole of the bridezillas, um, it's, it's, are they being a bridezilla or are they trying to make sure that their important day is, is going the way that they want it? But automatically, there's a term now for that. There's bridezilla. What if a groom decides, oh, I want the catering to be like this? Is, is he bridezilla or is he like taking charge and knowing what he wants? There's a groomzilla. There's a groomzilla. <laughs> we should in, 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 in psych. Is, oh, yeah, there is. That's right. But yeah, that's what I think about. I think um, oftentimes... Um, women are given a label because if they are operating outside of what is expected of them. Um, so a woman is, is supposed to be non-confrontational. She's supposed to, the, the, why don't you smile more that, that trademark lovely phrase. Um, your women are supposed to be there to look pretty and to just make sure things are going effectively behind the scenes, but really not make too much of a scene. And the moment you do, you're a sassy, spicy Latina, or you are an angry black woman. Why don't you just calm down? Is something going on in your life? Um, it's not like I've ever heard any of this before, obviously, as I talk about very specific things. Um, but that's what I think of. I think it is a label that is placed upon women. Like we feel the need to categorize women as difficult whenever they don't follow the mold that was created for women by society. So that's what I think about. And it's it difficult women is is I think it is a fake word term. It is women oftentimes just uh, expressing their own thoughts and people not liking what those thoughts are. That's that's my perspective. But now, yes, we are going to open up to the audience um, and ask what you guys think about or what you all rather sorry think about that. And we can keep talking. We but... can absolutely keep talking. I think of characters that maybe in Meryl Streep play. Okay. I think of Cher. I mean, who else has played characters like that? Difficult. You know? um, Homeland. Who was a comment with them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love Cher. She was full of rage. Yeah. I guess any woman that was uh, brave enough to stand up and just rant for a little mm -hmm. while, you know, mm -hmm. or she was angry enough, you know. To do that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts or has anybody been called difficult before? Who's a woman here? Yeah. Yeah. Woman. yeah. <laughs> and knowing both of you, you are both not at by any means. So shame on whoever called y'all that. I know high five. You know, honestly though, I think I think at this point, being called a difficult woman or the angry black woman or the sassy Latina or whatever reference you want in that vein it's almost a badge of honor at this point. Like, let's turn off around the script. It is no longer you are insulting me. It is, yeah, I am, deal with it. And I think we should approach it from, from that yeah. perspective. Yeah, and on that note, um, when asked why she titled the collection Difficult Women, uh, Gay told the Chicago Review, as I considered the women in this collection, I realized they would be termed difficult because that's a catch-all term for women who don't shut up and look pretty. Exactly what Trisha said. Mm -hmm. In another interview, this this one was with Vogue, she explained, I think women are oftentimes termed difficult when we want too much, when we ask for too much, when we think too highly of ourselves or have any kind of standards. I wanted to play with this idea that women are difficult when in reality, it's generally the people around them who are the difficult ones. 
Um, in one Vogue interview, she was asked if she had ever been referred to as a difficult woman. And yes, she her response was, oh, definitely. And I have no problem with that label. If having a personality and having opinions makes me difficult, then yes, I am very difficult. Um, and I think to your point of like, yeah, let's let's use it as a badge of honor. And that idea of like, your family or whomever, you know, mm -hmm. you're usually like go with the flow. But if you really care about something, yeah. um, you know, you mentioned this morning, it's like social justice issues. That's where your family like it's like, OK, calm down. Yeah, yeah. But no, you like you should keep fighting and arguing. And I think like if you're passionate about something like Lisa and Tara, I know you're both passionate people. And if you really care, and you know, have your opinions based on, you know, data and facts and, and testimonies, like you're going to stand up for yourselves and for the, you know, the people you represent, whatever it may be. And so, yeah, I, I can I can see the fact that y'all were called difficult women, but I agree with Trisha. Like, you're not difficult women in the sense of like, you need to calm down. Um, <laughs> one of the stories in Difficult Women is titled "Difficult Women," the short story, and she lists um, various types of difficult women, which include loose women, frigid women, crazy women, mothers, and dead girls. Um, I'm going to read a quick excerpt from the story on crazy women, which begins what a crazy woman thinks about while walking down the street. She tries to walk not too fast and not too slow. She doesn't want to attract any attention. She pretends she doesn't hear the whistles and catcalls and lewd comments. Sometimes she forgets and leaves her house in a skirt or a tank top because it's a warm, dry day and she wants to feel warm air on her bare skin. Before long, she remembers. She keeps her keys in her hand, three of them held between her fingers like a dull claw. She makes eye contact only when necessary, and if a man should catch her eye, she juts her chin forward, makes sure the line of her jaw is strong. When she leaves work or the bar late, she calls a car service, and when the car pulls up to her building, she quickly scans the street to make sure it's safe to walk the short distance from the curb to the door. She once told a boyfriend about these considerations, and he said, you are completely out of your mind. She told a new friend at work and she said, honey, you're not crazy. You're a woman. So, I mean, Trisha and I can talk about the stories and the, and like the anecdotes from both, from both of the books. Um, but I feel like that just encapsulated like difficult women as a term and then crazy women, you mm -hmm. know, the, like, are we paranoid or are we just women living in the world in which we find ourselves? Yeah. I've been told I was paranoid because of how I behave. Um, well, you do listen to a lot of true crime. I so. do also. That does make me paranoid. <laughs> um, you, you hear one too many kidnapped, killed stories and, and you become paranoid. Yeah. Um, what is your battery percentage on your phone? Never below like 50%? Yeah. <laughs> I do not. Yes. I don't. As a matter of fact, I'm mini panicking because I'm at 42 right now. So I need a charger <laughs> at some point soon. You will find me finding one after this, this whole session. Um, I realized just kind of going along the lines of, um, that excerpt and what, what she practices. Uh, I went to St. Louis for the first time, um, by my, well, it was with my mom, but it was two women traveling together. Um, I'd never been there. I've honestly never really traveled to a huge city solo or just with one other person who was a woman. Um, I realized, um, when I was walking, because we did a lot of walking, we didn't, we flew there, so we didn't rent a car or anything. We kind of stayed in a general area. Um, when walking, I took on broader, my shoulders got broader, I stood up taller, and I took more aggressive strides. Um, I, it was not my normal walk. I can very, and my, I was like constantly glancing everywhere around me. Um, my mom, who, you know, my mom, is growing. I like huge kudos to my mom, but she's growing, but she very much comes from an old world kind of perception. Um, and she, she noticed that about me and she wasn't saying anything against it. She was just like, yeah, I noticed you get like your, your bossy stance when you, when we were walking down the sidewalk and I was like, do I, then I noticed I was, and it's that whole, it's the fears. Mm -hmm. It's the fears that we have. And other people might think it's crazy or people who haven't experienced that or don't understand that society, um, you know, 
not makes us weaker, but perceives us as weaker and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I have been told, like I've, I have had conversations with, with friends before some were male and some were female to be fair. And I've told them how I behave and how I'm always watching my surroundings and I always have to watch this. And I'm, I'm very big about calling people when I'm going to leave somewhere and just letting them know like, Hey, I'm leaving here at some point. Or if I'm going out with somebody and I don't know them, Hey, I'm going here. And these are the people very paranoid, <laughs> probably partially because of all my true crime stuff. But another thing is, is a lot of times those true crime stories come with, it is a woman who was just leaving work and was, you know, getting off shift and she got kidnapped and abducted mm -hmm. or got assaulted or, um, whatever. And, yeah. and it's, it's terrifying. It's the world we live in. I don't listen to the, the true crime podcast, but I, I do listen to Anna Ferris is unqualified mm -hmm. and she was interviewing somebody and I see I'm terrible with names. Right. Um, but she asked them, you know, do you think that our gender, like f women or femme presenting people are like kind of obsessed with it because it does um, kind of it like verifies that mm -hmm. like we should be paranoid because all of these things happen mm -hmm. and they often happen to yeah. women or people of color. Um, and so yeah. Keep going. Oh, oh, find your quote. <laughs> I need to, but keep going. <laughs> no, that that was that was just my point of like I think that it is a fascination for some people because it does kind of like yeah. validate our fears and our and so-called paranoia. I think that's possible. I think it's it, on it's it's like a how-to manual. <laughs> it's like what not to do. How not to get murdered. How not right? yeah, yeah, which there's a book and I think in our popular co reading collection that is called that. <laughs> Um, but well, there's how not to get shot, which is a whole nother. Oh like, gosh, that that's an FYI. That's another one that had me nodding a lot. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, so a lot the, of sticky notes. In that yes. One, yeah. So the quote is: so this was specifically speaking about um, um, it, it's it's a subsection that stood out to me on sexual violence. Um, so uh, so many quotes. Where to start? Um. Kendall talks about how um, she talks uh, quite a bit about the sexual violence against particularly women of color. Um, one of the things that she says, it, it's prolific. Women of color are often targets. And so the, the quote I wanted to reference was, it, it's a short quote, and it says, offenders will choose those who are least likely to be protected. Um, and there, there was a news report. This goes back to our very poor memories collectively here. Um, but there was a news report of a, a young woman who was arrested and she was being held in a cell. Um, and it was this, this particular cell was very enclosed. It was more of a room than a cell. Um, and a, she was a black female and a white male police officer entered the cell and sexually assaulted her. Um, and it, there, there is very much within cultures or within uh, communities of color um, a distrust. It is a historically learned distrust of authority. When you have stories like this of this young woman who was arrested for something, I don't even think it was it was it was a repeat offense or so it was like either a DUI or something somewhat minor, if you will. Um, not that that whatever she did has any reason for for what happened to her. But there is this this he got he didn't hopefully this kind of came to light, but it took a really long time for this to come to light mm -hmm. that this happened because she reported it. Took her a while to get there because, again, that distrust. So she eventually reported it. Um, it took forever for them to actually look into it. And when they did, there was a video camera in that cell. And you could see that he what he did. So to, the, to prove it would have been ridiculously easy. But the amount of time it took for them to finally investigate this, while he was still employed, mm -hmm. still working still doing what, who knows what to, to offenders. But she was a young black woman who was a quote unquote criminal and had no support behind mm -hmm. her. And she does go on to say, cause she talks about, so for young black American girls, there is no presumption of innocence by people outside our communities. 
And too many inside our communities have bought into the victim blaming ideology that respectability will save us, not acknowledging that we are so often targeted regardless of how we behave. And I th that's something that she speaks a lot about is respectability, that there is this notion that if you behave respectable, you won't have any problems. Like nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to target you. Um, keep your head down. Stay clean. Do what you have to do. Say your yes, ma'am. Yes, sirs. Um, be a, a quote unquote good girl mm -hmm. and you will be safe. That has proven false, unfortunately, for many um, and it's, it's like, what do you do at that point when, when being the good girl doesn't protect you, when you try to act like a good girl and you end up becoming a victim and you go and you try to rely on your family who normally would be a good base and they tell you, well, what did you do? Um, what were you wearing? Or did you not look at your, sir? It always comes back to, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you, it, it becomes victim blaming. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you supposed to do in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. And I, I look at you and I ask that question. <laughs> no, you don't have an answer. Um, but it, it was it was such an interesting uh, part of the, the 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 conversation. I think that's the frustrating part is I don't think anybody until society changes, I don't think we have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually launches into another thing about hypersexualization of a, a girl's body. And this is. Um, because we talked about this too, about um, people of color, young girls, so underage girls, often being perceived as more adult mm -hmm. than they actually are. So old adultification, and that comes in the form of, one, they ha they're treated like adults at home because who knows what their, their background life is, but maybe they had to grow up fast and, and they're taking care of their younger siblings or they're helping out with like, they have to go to work early, just help support the family. Or their mom's um, working two jobs. So they're mom's balancing working the books two jobs. Home. So there's that form of adultification where their childhoods are being taken away from them because of poverty or whatever situation they're in. But then there's also forced adultification from society that they look at these primarily young women of color and presume because they, they feel attracted to her, they start assuming that um, she's older mm -hmm. and treating her like that. Mm -hmm. I have a personal story of that happening to me mm. where I was 13 years old and middle-aged men were saying very inappropriate things to me. Very disturbing, but it happens. Like there is mm -hmm. this, 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 and I, I'm not sure why that, that, that they feel, especially for women of color, that this assumption of, oh, she's older. I'm going to treat her like she's older. Yeah. I was very much not looking older. Yeah. And, I never <laughs> looked older than than I was. And Kendall but. talks about it because, you know, I mean, your story is, is you know, we can't dismiss your story, but it is one perspective, right? And mm -hmm. she talks about, um, I have it n noted somewhere, um, through the, yeah, there was a, a study from 2017 Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality called Girl Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls' Childhood. In this study, all of the 325 adults in the study felt that black girls seemed older than white girls of the same age. So they asked 325 adults, how old do you think she is? A white woman, how old do you think she is? A woman of color. And they always thought that the yeah. woman of color was older than she was. Yeah. And so, yeah, just I am not trying to dismiss your, your no, perspective, but that, I, yeah. you know, we we can sit here and talk and get, you know, weird comments on YouTube um, <laughs> about how patriarchy build the Western world. Well, yeah, they did. And yeah. That, 100%. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, but, um, yeah. So yeah, I yeah. think that, you know, one thing I was thinking about is that it was interesting that I chose a fiction story, yeah. a fiction short stories to talk about and you chose um, nonfiction and both women took from, you know, Mickey Kendall kind of talked anecdotally about here's my experience mm -hmm. and then here are all the studies that also back up my experience. Roxanne Gay, you know, she talks a lot about, um, 
you know, her short stories are fiction, but they are definitely rooted in like her sexual assault trauma mm -hmm. or her work and lived experience. And um, so I think that's interesting. Like we're librarians. We do like to read books. Um, that is a stereotype. Not all librarians <laughs> like to read. Um, but the, you know, we are at a research institution. So we do have to, you know, we, we talk about like qualitative and quantitative data. Right. And, um, you know, we, we need the qualitative data or like the personal lived stories to to for that like emotional factor. But we also need the quantitative data to say like systematically, this is how women and especially women of color are treated in our society. And so we need like both sides yeah. of the coin. Yeah. yeah. I think the way in our discussion, ethos and logos appeal to the, the emotional and appeal to the logic. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a great partnership between those two. Um, but yeah, yeah. So anybody should else? Should we open it up to any other Absolutely like can. thoughts, feedback? Yeah, yeah. What's up? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah, Lisa. Um, I'll, I'll share a story about a crazy woman. Um, I, I love my mother uh, was had mental health challenges, and I can tell you that one of the reasons why she did. I, I was born in 1963, so my mom, you know was that 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. leave it to beaver kind of culture. And, and extremely intelligent, though, very energetic, musical. And she had no outlet. Mm -hmm. You know, her her box that she was able to live in was, was a pretty small one. And the, the parameters for her behavior were very restricted for what was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And it literally drove her crazy mm -hmm. because she couldn't be herself yeah. and be in the box. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another way that a woman can be crazy. It's not yeah. just being paranoid. It can be just so frustrated, mm -hmm. I think. And so um, I think in some ways just angry and feeling also betrayed maybe mm -hmm. by her family and by her, her culture in some ways that she just yeah. mm -hmm. she had a hard time holding it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned being born in 63. My mom was born in 60. And when Mad Men first started airing, my mom was like, this show is great. It's like, it's like, Re reminiscent of my childhood and as I was watching the show I was like mom it, like this isn't like idealizing the past what what are you talking about <laughs> but my mom's also one of those like pretty pictures and we're not yeah, going to talk about yeah, like the yeah. uncomfortable stuff of yeah. the 60s and yeah all that all that jazz but um yeah we, we see the I mean, it, that show also depicted like women who mm -hmm. were you know stepping outside of the boundary and getting lobotomies because of it and things mm -hmm. like that like history has not treated women or specifically women of color well at all. Yeah. I also think it's interesting to know um, when we witness uh, a woman going crazy or a woman having a moment where she's so frustrated, she's, she's talking out. And it's interesting to note my internal feelings watching that and the group that the crowd or whatever that's drawn to it and looking at people and their reactions to it as well. And there's an array of different different um, expressions on people's faces mm -hmm. and some people are for them and some people get whipped up with it. And then I always have a mix of, uh, oh girl, mm -hmm. and I also have a mix of, oh, I'm kind of an embarrassed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so we're always fighting that those two dual things in ourselves that we want to be more like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. People will perceive us. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Um, going back to the conversation of, of women being more assertive or difficult, if you will. Um, we had a conversation last week. What are days? I don't know, two weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to guess pay, where, pay, where you're going. Yeah. The pay, uh, in the pay wage and, and pay visibility and things like that and pay gap. Um, 
And we were talking about, uh, Alexa kindly shared some articles and one of the articles, um, it, it cited an example and this woman decided to go in and be very aggressive with, with her negotiations. And she was told to go to etiquette class that she came in too aggressively. She was trying to, what was the phrase that they used? Um, I have, it was something along the lines of she was, she was trying to be too male, like, uh, to compensate. I think that's what they use. She was trying to compensate by being too masculine and that, and this, this is, you know, the higher ups, these are the C she was in a very business world. And so these are the CEOs, the leaders of this company saying she was compensating and she needs to go to a feminine etiquette class to learn how to be a proper woman she wants to make it in this field and it was just like shut up first of all <laughs> like no but but it's 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 the case it's the case that we see um unfortunately still mm -hmm. like as much as we'd love to say that society has changed yes it's not I think as overt as it was right um just the same way that people aren't casually drinking and smoking in the office like that's Darn, not happening as good. often theoretically <laughs> um but it's still happening. It's mm -hmm. still happening that women are are put down for being. And so then there, it is internalized. Then we as women see, mm -hmm. oh, she tried. And that's what they told her. What hope do I have? Right. Like, I might as well just not say anything. Yeah. And, and that's rough, too, because then we just perpetuate the whole situation. And it's just this very vicious cycle Yeah. Um, yeah. that doesn't end. I have two things. One is I think – in, in reading those articles, it might have been the same article or another one. And um, if anyone's interested in any of the things Trish and I are referring to, we can find our yes, sources. Yeah. We're just not good <laughs> at like, having them on the tip of our tongues. Um, somebody, it was suggested that if you're a woman, rather than be confident and assertive and ask for what you think you deserve, to flirt with the people who determine your salary and, and, and try to get your way that way. And I think it was referring to something that's, you know, 20, 30 years old, but the fact that that was ever suggested of like, this is my worth, pay me this, that's you know, I think so. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah, I think the article referenced to that. Sorry, I didn't okay, mean to yeah, interrupt. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah, that's spot on. Yeah. I also haven't read it. Like yeah. 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 Has anyone actually read it and can like say one way or another? Because I I've heard of it, but I actually I haven't read it either. Mm -hmm. I think so. I'm bad yeah, with names. Like Google, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The other thing that came to mind, Lori, when you were talking, this is in a different context, but something I saw on Facebook, I think years ago was like the first thing that your mind thinks is what society like expects you to react. So if you see like a woman walking down the street and you're like, oh, she's dressed like a slut. Like that's how mm -hmm. society has trained you to react. And then you go, oh, girl, like it's hot out or you look hot or like you wear whatever you want because that's your choice and you should be able to do that. And so it's like the second thing that you that comes to mind is like what you really think. And the first thing is just like, you know, gut reaction, society yeah. trained you that way kind of thing. Yeah. We have to retrain. Yeah. I know. We yeah. have to relearn yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, so, so one thing that I did want to touch on with this conversation is the concept of intersectionality feminism, um, because I think that's where where hood feminism kind of lives a bit. So yeah, the, I think the notes from the women yes, that exactly. I forgot is talking about like white feminism. Yeah. Right? So so a lot of what it's um, what it references to is the fact that when feminism and when women's rights began, they left a lot out. Um, so you had mentioned the soda tax earlier. Um, she does talk a lot about food insecurity and, um, child care and poverty and, um, you know, uh, what's things of that nature. Those are feminist, um, issues mm -hmm. that aren't commonly addressed when we talk about traditional feminism. Traditional feminism is kind of 
which not to say like not to delegitimize some of the conversations that happen within the feminism conversations. Um, but most, most conversations are things like the pay gap and things of that nature. And, and, you know, um, working as a, a stay at home mom and still getting respected in your society or going back to work after giving birth, all very legit, important conversations. But then it does, it does, there is judgment cast by feminists on these women who are giving their kids soda mm -hmm. or, right. or pop. And there's judgment cast on women who um, put their children into childcare early on, or I think uh, it, so she, one of the questions she says is, is it possible to work a full-time job when you can't even afford part-time childcare? <sighs> So, so women who are on food stamps or something like that, because they, they don't have a full-time position that pays enough that's going to cover to feed their kids. Um, those are all feminist issues that, that need to be addressed and are often not addressed. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that uh, the, the conversation of the LGBTQ community, so trans women and, uh, you know, women who those who identify as women and things like that, we, those need, they need to be included as well in, in feminist conversations. And that is something that I really did appreciate because she spoke a lot about feminist issues from perspectives that are not often top of the chain mm -hmm. and how that, that could be changed or readdressed. Um, she going back to the respectable being a respectable person and i think you might have some one of your sticky notes on on this section maybe um but she talks about women who are um you know, prostitutes or who go into prostitution or who are strippers yeah. um things like that those are not respectable quote unquote um positions and and there's automatic judgment for that but if if you came from a background where you were already struggling. So growing up, you became a woman um, at the age of 12 or 13, both because of having, you know, the struggling with your family um, and having to help out and with the hypersexualization of your own body at the age of 12 or 13. And then you grow up still within still the struggling type of society and your options are very limited. Like, why are we looking down on these people that is it? Would they love to be a CEO of an up and coming company? Absolutely. <laughs> that would be great. But but it's a struggle. And to dismiss them and look down upon them, I think, is a shame. Mm -hmm. um, and she does speak to that about that. Those are groups of people that are left out of feminist conversations. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, they're they're almost shunned by modern feminists or feminists because of what they do. Um, and did you find, I'm very curious. Yeah, I did. But I also realized we forgot to talk about the raffle and oh. we, it's, we, have, <laughs> we have 15 minutes left. So we do have a copy of each of the books that we're talking about. And if you want to enter into winning one of them, um, there is a bucket. Did we ever get pieces of paper? We did. There's okay. sticky notes back there. So there are sticky notes and I think pens if you want to enter in the raffle before we're done with this. And anybody who's online, drop your name in the chat and we'll add your name to the, the raffle as well. Yes. Um, so the section that I think Trisha was referring to um, is she's talking about sex workers and that assertions that sex workers can't be assaulted or that they exist as a release valve to prevent sexual violence are fundamentally rooted in narratives that render bodies disposable without interrogating how deep into rape culture these so-called feminist narratives have fallen. Um, and something that I thought of while you were talking, um, a book I read a few years ago now is called Whipping Girl, and it is about how some, you know, like uh, some groupings of so-called feminists exclude trans people because mm -hmm. it's like it's like the woman, like W-O-M-B, woman spelling, um, and that how that's like if feminism is supposed to be about like inclusivity, and then we're gonna say, but like, but women of color have to wait their turn or like trans women are not women. Like that, that to me is asinine, but yeah. that, that's my personal opinion. Um, and I forgot the other thing that I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what it was. Um, the, the show on Hulu that just came out, Pam and Tommy, 
um, about Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee's sex tape that like really made the internet like a big deal for porn um, from my limited perspe perspective. But I think that they handled the treatment of women, specifically Pamela Anderson, really well in the show. And like, I'm sure there are critiques and very valid ones, but from my perspective, it was like her, her statements. And of course this is an actress portraying Pamela Anderson. Pamela Anderson was not consulted on the show, even though she, they tried to reach out and she's going to have her own Netflix documentary. So we'll find out her side of the story. Um, but she, the character who plays Pamela Anderson is saying like the, the judge ruled this way and this happened because they can't, they can't officially call me a slut and say that I don't have rights to images of my own body because I already subjected myself to that by agreeing to be in Playboy and mm -hmm. things like that. And just the treatment uh -huh. of like, we want women to do these things. We want them to be sexualized objects, but then we don't give them agency into at what point do they get to stop if they're sex workers, you know, you know, you can't, um, it's you can't sexual sex workers can't be assaulted like that mm -hmm. statement and that that belief is just yeah. crazy to yeah. me but that's one difficult woman's perspective <laughs> I suppose. what are the the quotes from the book about um and and i feel like this kind of encompasses what the point of of her putting this this book out um or at least one of the the purposes is, is she's talking about um feminism and feminism being needing to be more rounded and more inclusive of other aspects of feminism. Um, and she says, it's not enough to show up for the big battles. Unfortunately, feminism has to show up for every battle or it can rapidly find itself nearly powerless to prevent moments like the poor moments that we've, we've kind uh -huh. of brought up today. Um, and I think that's, in, that's important to note. Um, and it's, it's a, like I said, it's one of the main, points that she tries to get across mm -hmm. in, in this book is, is there are so many sub concerns within the realm of feminism. In this case, she as a black woman takes it from the perspective that she's most familiar with. So mm -hmm. as a black woman. Um, but, but I think that the, it's just, there are so many things that need to be considered. And um, she also has a whole section where she talks about um, allyship to accomplices. Like it's great to be an ally um, and to be there to support and, and, um, and, and, you know, encourage and things like that. But then the next step would be becoming an accomplice. Mm -hmm. So becoming that voice, um, you know, speaking up and, and I've had, I actually had a conversation this week, um, because it was a, a, a group of women with like two men in the room with us. And there was a comment that was made by by a woman and all the women in the room were like, yeah. And then there was a comment made by a man and all of the women just kind of were like, okay. Now it's awkward. And okay, bye everyone. Was, was I in the room? You might have been all in right. the room, I think I which is why I'm not saying specifics because I, I don't want to. Um, so afterwards, I had a conversation with one of the women who was in the room as well. And we didn't say anything like it was awkward. So there was all that. I guess the silence was somewhat of a statement, but it wasn't a very firm statement. We didn't say anything. We were just all awkward and said bye and moved on. <laughs> we left the room. So then there was a conversation between me and this other person who was in the room. And we realized that was a perfect opportunity to redirect and, re and correct. Mm -hmm. um, it was the we, we, we speak about the things that we stand for and that we want to happen and the changes we want to make. And it, this is not an excuse. I mean, but it's that we've been taught women, especially to be well-behaved mm -hmm. and to not be difficult women and to be quiet and in gut instinct, the embarrassment, the, I don't want to challenge this. I don't want to cause an issue. Yeah. So we all defaulted. Yeah. This is a room full of women who have sat where we are, have had conversations about how to be better, how mm -hmm. to be more inclusive, diverse, respect. We defaulted. Like, it is a challenge. It is yeah. not easy to move into that accomplice position. Mm -hmm. um, it is a challenge to get to that point and realize, hey, what could I have done differently 
that would have been more effective. Yeah. It's, um, it's those moments that are like, it's cringy in the moment and you're not sure why. And then you like have to examine reflect on it. why it was cringy at the time. Yeah. Um, I saw on Twitter, I love Twitter, um, a committee, a woman who is the chair of a committee said, okay, at the beginning, of the, she was the only woman on the committee. In the beginning, she said, every time one of you interrupts me, I'm going to slap my hand on the table. And the number of, like, they all sat there and realized just how often they interrupt her. And this isn't to say, like, you know, men don't interrupt other men or women don't interrupt other women or women don't interrupt men. But, it like, it is, the like, the standard, right, is that women get interrupted all the time. Do you want to say something? Yeah. So thank you for this conversation. Can you say this loud word again? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I just want to go back for a minute to the like cringy moment mm -hmm. that's hard to deal with because I think on the one hand, in my experience, like the training that like you're internalizing yeah. and then living in is the training of like respectability mm -hmm. for each white for white like for white women respectability politics is a little bit less complicated than like adopted. But like some of so some of it's about that and sort of like being a good person and, uh -huh. and stuff, whatever. But the other thing I think I feel in those kinds of moments is how being a woman in a setting like that means already that you're vulnerable. Uh -huh. And so like part of what I'm feeling in those kinds of experiences is like, oh, I like I could get screwed over by uh -huh. this thing. like not just I should be quiet and good because it's good to be good because I'm a lady and lady. Good yeah, that, yeah. Like, that you recognize that you are putting yourself at yes. risk as an individual. Yes. Too. That retaliation. So, yes, retaliate. Like, mm -hmm. just for, that, for whatever that looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So, some, and I don't, and I'm not saying, like, that's a reason not to do mm -hmm. things, but, like, what that suggests to me is that one way deal with that problem that is actually possibly helpful is to like have a kind of a system like I don't know safer is the right mm -hmm. right but like yeah if this we all all the women in this room in this context agree that like if if something happens to one of us that thing is happening to all of us mm -hmm. and the response then has to come from every single person yep. as opposed to like Shit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. Come on, Trisha. <laughs> Did it? You're good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 It yeah. does. Oh, it makes 100%. 100% yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> and I think that, like, the retaliation, like, if it, and, you know, it all depends. But I think in that scenario, it could even be, like, the only retaliation is, like, the next interaction with that person might awkward. be awkward, right? Um, but that's, like, the, like, best case scenario, worst case scenario is, like, that's your boss and they can fire you or, you know, give you a bad evaluation or not give you a good recommendation or, or something. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Right. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. 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 And that, that absolutely is, is a struggle. Like I appreciate you bringing that up because it is, it's, it's beyond just the, you know, yeah, so we're not failures. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's beyond the, 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 that default or trying to be a good person, it is that fear it, that 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 we live in. It is it's this is the extreme form of that fear, but it's why we walk down the street with keys in our hand and things like that. Sorry, no, sorry. keep going, <laughs> keep going <laughs> by all means. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> Same. Like, that's like, that's, yeah. It's about recognition and sort of like yeah. a realistic sense of the things that are at risk. Yes. Even if those things that are at risk are like, I feel an inch tall and I mm -hmm. am in a 
professional setting in which I'm highly accomplished and like that. And yet you still, right? yeah, yeah. No, no, don't, don't be sorry at all. That's something that we do as women too, right? We apologize a lot. Like I say sorry for everything. For talking. Yeah. My sister, my sister and I were having lunch at a, a restaurant in, in Colorado. And the it was one of those like you get your food, they bring it, but like there's they're not really servers. And but the manager, we went to this place all the time and he like recognized us. He picked our plates up because we were just sitting there talking. And he dropped a knife and my sister apologized to him. Yeah. And he he stopped and he was like, why are you apologizing? <laughs> and she was like, sorry. And he was like, no, really. Like, <laughs> and he explained that he he was in uh, like an improv group or something. And one of one of his fellow actors was a woman. And she did that. Like she caught herself as to how many times she apologizes for things that are not her fault, including like walking down the street and you 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 move out of the way because you're female or you apologize for hitting someone when it's like not your fault yeah. at all but or or it's like you're both at fault in that no one's at fault and but you still say sorry <laughs> and so I've tried to correct myself but of course we do it all the time right yeah, yeah. I think a big part of all of this is what we fill underneath it, it's what drives us and it's we feel powerless yeah so often in our culture it's true and um then when you have achieved a certain amount of um, a certain amount of your career or a certain amount of money, and then all of a sudden you feel vulnerable that somebody will take that away, but it's the powerless feeling that we were taught, which was necessary for our survival mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. You know, yeah. your fears. It's it's hard it's hard to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to get over that. It's hard to recognize exactly what it is and say, no, I do have the power. Because do we? Yeah. 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 I'd like to believe so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Just quickly, I also wonder how many of us here feel like we could kind of call out a colleague in a meeting but do it in a constructive way. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel that I, in my years, have really been taught well how to have that kind of a conversation. Mm -hmm. And part of that is power dynamics, probably. Mm -hmm. And part of that is gender dynamics and all of that, because we're talking about the better room of women with a couple of men, right? The gender dynamics mm -hmm. right there. But I just don't feel that that kind of really honest, conversation that mm -hmm. we've been taught how to have those kinds mm -hmm. of conversations and particularly in a work environment yeah and we all benefit if we could do that so sounds like a workshop is coming up soon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, co-chair of the Inclusion okay. Diversity, Equity, and... <laughs> Looks like I'm planning a workshop, everyone. <laughs> I mean, you can tag someone yeah, yeah. To, to do it, but... Yeah. Um, there was this quote that I really liked here, and it's it's connected to, to what we just were talking about, because we were talking about... Um, this is how it's connected. It's talking about the women who are willing to step up and be the more aggressive feminist, if you will. And I just love it because of how it's phrased. Um, but then there are also the nice feminists, and that's what this section's talking about. It's it's there, and you'll see as I read. Um, there are people in feminist circles who are nice, who are diplomatic with soothing ways and the warm personality that enables them to put up with other people's shit without complaining. Me. I'm right there. Um, they have their lane, and for the most part, I think they handle things well. But my lane is different. I'm the feminist people call when being sweet isn't enough. When saying things kindly, repeatedly is not working. I'm the feminist who walks into a meeting and says, hey, you're fucking up and here's how. And nice feminists feign shock at that. <laughs> and I love people who walk into a meeting because I think, you know, it's, it's kudos to the women who, despite that in internalize um like i i feel like i'm the mi minority here um or the fear that we've learned who despite those will stand up and be like hey no this is wrong this is how it should be from now on um but going off of what you were saying earlier sarah that's where the rest of us us the nice quote unquote nice ones like i am self-claiming i am would be 
get to come in and start saying like, I support that. I support, like she says they feign shock. And I think that does happen. I think I would like to us to, those of us who would dub ourselves as the nice feminist to challenge ourselves that should somebody challenge something that's happening in the room to be willing to have that voice that supports it. You may not have to say much. It could just be like, I agree, done. Um, but I think even just having that voice that this is not just somebody being a difficult woman. This is somebody who is saying something valid and I support what they're saying. I would like to challenge and, and you know, for those who are not women in this group or identify as female in this group or who are watching now or later, um, you can also support those statements. Um, so yes, a woman can definitely support and I would challenge all the women to support those. But also if you identify as male um, or, you know, anything like that, support it as well. Say like, no, they have a point. I agree with that. Um, I, I suggest uh, that's what I would try to challenge or present to people. Yeah. I think we should raffle because it's 402. Let's um, raffle. Okay. Thank yeah. you everybody okay. for yeah. being here. <laughs> you wanna, did um, people get to write their names and put them in the stuff? Thank you Maybe. everyone for coming, whether you entered the raffle or not. We really appreciated everyone's support thank and you. comments <laughs> and feedback. And thank you. <laughs> Should we end the we can end, yes. End stream. Bye everyone.